It's um, really lovely to meet you. And my purpose today is to learn as much as I can about um, UK jazz and swing specifically. Um, but my motive is to support some of my dance students to understand better um, what swing music is and how they can interact with it. So it's quite common that dance students actually are afraid of the music in some way or feel that they're not sure how to be musical. So I'd love to kind of extract from you some tips and information on swing and what that means. I'm glad to help if I can. I love swing. And for how long have you been playing swing music? Must I tell you, rightly, Kat, is 50 years this year. I did my first real big jazz gig, if you want to call it that, at the Hundred Club in 1971 in July. So that is 50 years. And of course, the Hundred Club for years was also home of the London Swing Dance Society. Well, you know, it's funny because Nicola, who's a sweetie and very efficient, she sent that message over to me earlier in question. And I was trying to define groove. And I was going to start by doing a little bit of this and go one, two, oh, one, two, one, double, double, double. A groove to me is when the music is in what we call in musicians term, in the pocket, where it's exactly right. And there were certain musicians over the years who could pick a tempo that was absolutely on the button for the tune. Count Basie was one. Anything that Basie played was always in the pocket, in the groove. There were different grooves, and we'll probably go on to talk about those, the swing groove and the uh, what I call the, the rock groove, which is different. But I think it all comes down to that business of being able to find the tempo that's right for the tune and for the dancers, by the way, and then to slot it in and fit it so that it swings. And I can give you actually, if it helps, a musical example, because as a trumpet player, which is what I've been for quite a while now, um, I always know if the tempo is right, because I know where the one, the one beat is. Let's let's say most people when they dance, they're dancing in a four-four beat, I guess, aren't they? So they're basically doing one, two, one, two, three, four, four, I do, I do, I do. And part of the importance of that for a musician, just as for a dancer, is to know where the first beat of the bar is. In other words, if you haven't got one, two, three, four, four, one, two, if that isn't secure and in the pocket, then you have a kind of a floaty sensation which is probably just as difficult for a dancer as it is as it is for a musician. If it starts to shiver and shake and move around, then as for the dancers, I would imagine, they don't know how to lock in. And I think that's probably my definition of groove. It's finding the beat, getting it in the pocket, and in other words, knowing where you are with the beat. That's the groove to me. That's fabulous. And I think for, for, the, for dancers, um, the pocket for us, I think, is just behind the musical pocket. Because, of course, if you're, if you're really trying to listen and lock in with the band, if you're too early or even sometimes on time, you're going to miss the, you're gonna miss the groove. You're going to be ahead. Wow, that's interesting. Well, that hadn't occurred to me, but I can quite see it in the 50s and 60s. One of the things that musicians did was to hang behind the beat. There's an old record of, of Basie doing a song called Will Darling, which is quite slow. And it's do 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 ba 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 And uh, at one time it got to be such a thing that it, it became aggravating because of <laughs> the trying to hang behind the beat, you know. And you say, oh, no, come on, come on, please, get that groove going. But I think for our purposes, when we're working with dancers like yourself, our business is to place the groove on beat one. 
and then you can play with it yourselves because you're actually improvising on what we're playing, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was very indicative, actually, when, when you were, were kind of singing the one, is how often you're um, doing a lead-in or a pick-up. And this idea musically, a lot of the time when we think of melody, we do think, oh, it starts on the one. And a lot of jazz moves start on eight. Most oh. jazz moves start on eight. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a great one that we agree completely on that Louis Armstrong did on a lot of his solos, which um, Winter Marsalis, who's another jazz trumpeter, pointed out, which is one, two, three. Va do ba do ba boo ba do ba boo da boo ba da. So there's that kind of fanfare that says, "Look out, I'm coming," and it picks up on the uh, well, it's actually on the second beat of the previous bar. One, two, three, four, one. Va da do da zoot. There you are, yeah. I think with the swing beat, it relied on the, what we used to call the three beat, which actually places the emphasis on the, what we call the tension beats, which is uh, two and four, the off beat. One and three are the steady beats. Swing beats rely on two and four, which is how naturally the, the dancers and musicians among us snap our fingers. So say we're listening to some jazz and we've got ba boo ba do ba do and do 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 I'll count us in one, two, three. Ba boo ba do and do and do and do do ba boo ba do and do and do and do do so I'm naturally clapping on the offbeat. And if you transpose that into what the drummer was doing on the hi-hat or the top symbol, it's So that comes on the beats two and four, which naturally lead you on. Now, and that's how swing drummers worked. Now, the funny thing is that when rock and roll came along, in specifically the Beatles, I'd say, but certainly once you had Tamla Motown or um, Jazz Fusion, you had a specifically different beat, which we call straight eight. Now, this means that instead of uh, the emphasis on the two and the four, like, one, two, three, four, oh, that's the swing beat. All of a sudden you've got So the beats are equally emphasized over eight beats or four beats. So that doesn't swing. I, th I think you asked a really good question there. And the fact is that the swing beat is definable. And there's a point in popular music at which it stopped being fashionable. In your in your like amazing fifty year career, who who's the person you've played with who swung the hardest? Where you were like, this person is in the pocket. They're always like really feeling feeling and embodying that swing rhythm. So one of the first things that any jazz musician has to have is a good sound sense of time. And when I went into the business, actually, Cap, I didn't have one really. I used to rush ahead of the beat with my enthusiasm, and I. All the other musicians be going, hey, come back, come back, come back, come back and join us, you know, because I'd be half a beat ahead. <laughs> so um, it would be hard to tell you one particular musician, one American one, which you probably won't know about, but who was famous for his absolutely colossal sense of time and swing, was the American tenor player Al Cohn. Now, Al worked with Woody Herman. And later on, he worked with another great tenor player who was another example, Zoot Sims. And Al, I worked with Al on a couple of occasions when he came to England. And the thing that was most noticeable about Al, although he was a great improviser as well, was this fantastic sense of time. It was booting along. There were lots of jazz musicians like that. But that's just one I can think of. There were lots of great British ones as well. One of the people who's done our jazz workshops, jam sessions in this project, is a man called Pete Long. And he's got a sense of time that is enviable. You know. I fully agree. You know Pete? You know Pete? Yeah. Oh, Pete. oh cheers. Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> I think most people assume that when a jazz musician puts his trumpet or his saxophone to his lips or his trombone or behind the piano, 
that he just lets his mind empty and all these incredible creations come out. In fact, in my view, that's not true at all. I think musicians are maybe a little like comedians in that over the years they amass a stock, uh, in comedians' case, of gags. Or in the case of people like myself, it's, if you like, an accumulated repertoire of ideas. But I would say that when you're faced with a playing situation, as quick as, as lightning, you're listening to what you're playing or what's being played. And some in, from your subconscious, you bring out the jokes or the phrases that are going to work. And I apply that to a chord sequence. And um, sometimes, actually, over the years, um, I don't, do you know the tune Honeysuckle Rose by Fats Waller? Baba doodin dee, bee ba doodin doo, baba doodin doo doo doo. Well, the middle eight is ba 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 doo dee da da, boo da boo da, boo da ba doo boo boo doo. Well, I've got a whole middle eight that I worked out years ago that fits that whole thing, and I use it most times. Would you like to hear it? It goes. Oh, please. It comes and it goes. And that took me probably 10 years to, to complete. So if I come across a sequence that is same as Honeysuckle, there's been lots and lots of tunes based on that sequence, actually, including a lot of bebop tunes and swing tunes, then I know what I've got. So at least once I trot it out. I wouldn't do it twice because it's like, Say, telling the same joke twice, you know. But I know I've got something up there that's going to get me through. <laughs> and it, it's so interesting to me that you, you say that it's um, about repertoire because it, it's very much the same as, as what, what we have to learn as dancers, mm -hmm. is that, of course, there's something very beautiful about somebody's first read on hearing something and how they just interpret and, yeah, like, let go. Um, but generally, mm -hmm. if we're going to be improvising for whole songs, and in the case of swing dancers all night we're improvising the whole night and um, actually having the repertoire so you know oh i'm hearing this this is what my body can do and what is possible and um, that's when you really start to feel that you're you're adding a voice into what's happening right. and, and how does it affect you when people are dancing to your music oh i think it enlivens us see j jazz i think lost out when it stopped being a dance music. Dancing to jazz was endemic to the swing era, obviously. Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, Tommy Dorsey, Jimmy Dorsey, Harry James, all those people. They were dance bands as much as they were jazz bands. And people danced to it. When bebop came along in the 1940s with Dizzy, Gillespie and Charlie Parker and Monk, uh, jazz took on a whole new intellectual image, which said, um, well, okay, you can dance if you want to, but basically you should be listening to how clever we are, which of course is a marvelous thing in itself. But there's a lovely story that I remember about Stan Kenton, who was a big band leader in the 50s, who espoused progressive jazz. At one particular dance, he was playing some of his marvelous avant-garde creations in a dance hall. And a set of dancers, um, came up and tugged him, his band leader's trousers leg, you know, said, excuse me, Mr. Kenton, could you play something we can dance to? And Kenton looked down and snapped at them and said, why don't you dance something we can play to? And it's no coincidence to me that when bebop arrived in the 40s, and it all became very much more of a listening music, all of a sudden, what do you know, hoop de do, here comes rock and roll. You know, and you've got the beginning of R&B, you've got Louis Jordan, then a few years after, you've got Bill Haley and his Comets in the 50s, and the people are dancing and jiving and tearing up the cinema seats in the process too, by the way. And then within three or four years, you've got rock and roll, pure and simple. And I think people still do dance to traditional jazz a lot, probably a lot less to the more intellectual end of the music until, and I think, again, this is really interesting, you get to what's happening today and you have a new, whole new generation of players like, well, Shabaka Hutchins is one who I like a lot. He's a clarinet player and a rapper. But basically, I, I think once you take music away, popular music anyway, away from dancing, then you, you're you taking a leap in what a lot of people would call the wrong direction. Relating 
related to what we were just talking about before. So I've been been doing lots of research about the 100 Club and using some of your fabulous resources on the Jazz Centre website. Great. And all of the music on my course has been related somehow to artists that have played at the 100 Club. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so we've just done a week on Jimmy Rushing. Oh. I adore. Oh, me too. It's the five by five. Exactly. That's been fabulous because he has such a um, his work with um, Basie in the Newport uh, 57 concert is my favorite album of all time. With Lester Young. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, isn't that a gas? That's certainly in my top 10 too. It's fabulous. Yeah. Phenomenal. I always think when I'm watching a dancer or a musician, I'm thinking what's happening like in their head? What are they feeling and how, how are they then embodying what they're feeling? As to your point, as an artist, um, and to have things on film is the thing is so helpful to figure out what that thought process is. Um, you must go below the surface. And I think one of the problems that I face is that when I go on the stand, it's assumed that I'm going to have a good time and that I'm going to be on form. And in fact, very few people do, I think, I don't know how you feel because you're much younger than me, but very few people do feel on form every day, 24 hours a day. And sometimes I've had to drag myself on the stand and say, oh, God, here we go again, you know, and then, whoa, hello, great to be here, you know? <laughs> That's it. I mean, fake it till you make it is very, very true. You're doing the same thing in a way. You're waiting for the moment when all the inhibitions and the thought fly away and you're at one with your craft. It's a bit like saying, what's your favorite food? You know, I suppose if I had to take one artist to a desert island, it would be Louis Armstrong. Because I think he, rep he was the Shakespeare of jazz for me, the man who created, without pseudo profundity, the way to create the perfect jazz solo. And I can listen to Louis anytime and get something new. Um, a favorite tune, again, that's, that's difficult because the, the kind of tunes I don't like so much are the ones that present me with huge harmonic difficulties. Um, what's an example? Have You Met Miss Jones? Which has an extremely difficult, what we call middle eight. You know, most pop songs are eight bars, eight bars, middle bit, eight bars, right? 32 bar structure. And um, Have You Met, Met Miss Jones goes about four bits. And all at once I lost my breath and all at once was scared to death. And all at once I saw the earth and sky. And I'm going, oh my God, wait a minute, which scale am I on? I, I suppose if I had to pick one, um, it might be I Got Rhythm, because that's my Gershwin. And there were literally hundreds of tunes, apart from I Got Rhythm itself, which are based on the chord sequence of I Got Rhythm, which is very user friendly. And often if you get a jam session, you'll get a musician who'll say, hey, why don't we do something on rhythm changes? Which means on the chord changes of I Got Rhythm. Because they're accessible and fun to play on. And they're liable not to present you with a kind of sudden whack in the back and say, hey, wait a minute, what about that flat and minor seventh with a sharp 13 and 14 far? You know, ow, you know. How can you dismiss Duke Ellington? or Count Basie, or Ella, or Sarah Vaughan, or Chick Webb, who I absolutely adore. I think Chick oh, Webb... Oh, Chick Webb's incredible. Yep. Wow. Probably a better big band than Benny Goodman, I'd say, at, at points. Definitely. Yeah. But Chick's band was simply perfect. And um, I'm constantly amazed at, at him, yeah. I'd love to see those parts. And before I get too old, I wouldn't mind playing third trumpet on one of those bands as well. It's been such a fabulous conversation. And I really want to say thank you so much for supporting my teaching, but also my research with the, uh, with the Heritage Lottery Fund. I really you. appreciate it. Yeah, it's a total pleasure. Total pleasure. It's been lovely to talk to you. I never thought that somebody your age, I could talk about Coleman Hawkins, Chick Webb, and have somebody go, yeah, I know them. So thank you very much, Kat. Thank you. Um, I can't wait until I can come and visit the Jail Centre uh, and hear you play. Nice to meet you, Jim. I hope we'll meet in person soon.